What's up guys and welcome back to another video. So to start this video off, I don't know if you've ever been bored, chilling at home or whatever, and decided to play an easy AI in your favorite board game, only to realize that that AI was actually complete and utter trash. So then maybe you decide to play that same board game, but this time instead of that easy AI, you decided to play a very hard AI. And this time around, you know, you try to make every best move you could, but no matter what you did, it seemed like that AI was always one step ahead of you. So you ended up losing, and I don't know, you're pretty discouraged about the whole incident, to say the least. Well, if you've ever been through one of these experiences, or maybe you're just curious about how a board game AI works in general, then this is the video for you. In this video, we're going to build up the intuition for and then describe the traditional algorithm used in board game AIs using Connect4 as an example. And the reason I say traditional, I'll explain probably towards the end of the video. And then next, we'll apply this same algorithm to other games such as Othello, Chess, and Checkers. Okay, to begin, let's simulate what a very simple AI would look like. And to do this, I'll be player one. And our very simple AI will be player two, and it will just pick one of these random columns to drop the piece in. So this is column one, this is column seven, so we'll pick a number from one through seven, and that's what this little widget is on the screen, and that will be where we drop it. So we generate the first number, gives us a two. So I'll play right in the center. Generate the second number, and that is a five. So we'll go right there, our AI. So I'll play it in the center again. And here's kind of the issue with just generating a random number. Right now, we have to generate one column specifically to block my three in a row right now. So we only have a one seventh chance doing that with the random number AI. So we generate the number and it gives us a seven. So unfortunately, our random AI did not do the best and we win right here in the middle. Just some fun little math regarding this. If our random AI was to play perfectly, on a single move, we would expect that to happen about one in every seven times. On two moves in a row, approximately one in every 49 times three perfect moves in a row, approximately one in every 343 times, all the way to, let's say, I don't know, 10 moves in a row, which might be enough to win. That happens approximately one in every 282,475,249 times. And to just put that number in perspective, that is approximately the same probability of winning either the Powerball or the Mega Millions here in the United States. So obviously our random AI did not work the best. So let's try to develop a new strategy for our AI to follow. And to do this, we will build a scoring mechanism for our Connect4 board. And then our AI will make decisions based on what column produces the best board score. To figure out what criteria we should base our score on, we'll walk through a simple game and kind of list out all the thoughts and main ideas we have as a human playing the game. And hopefully we can convert those into concrete values that we can use in our AI. So to begin, I always like putting my first piece in the center column because that gives me the most possibilities to win with these horizontal options and the diagonal options. Same reasoning for the second move, same reason for the third move. And you know, now that I filled up the center column, I'm thinking about connecting lines of pieces together. So I like putting my piece right in here because that gives me a horizontal line of two pieces and a diagonal line of two pieces. Okay, building upon that, he put his piece on top of me here, so that gives me the option to put a line of three in a row, which is even better than two in a row. So I'll put my piece right here. And so he couldn't block both of my opportunities to win. And, you know, it's kind of a simple decision to make where you want to drop your piece now. There's two places I can win. So I'm going to choose one of those two to win. Okay, cool. So from that, we already have four different factors we can base our score off of. I also want to add real quick, we can't just play offensively to win a game. So we're also going to add some defensive factors to our score. And this happens so that we, you know, our AI knows to block. Opponent line of two is just the reverse of our line of two. And then opponent winnable line of three is when the opponent has three pieces in the same direction with the fourth move being possible on their next turn. Let's start assigning scores to these features and note that this is not an exact science. So if we were actually programming this AI, we'd kind of tune these values as we went and figure out what worked the best. Playing the center column is pretty important in my eyes. So I'm gonna give this a plus four as a score and note this will, as I just said before, this can be adjusted. Uh, next lines of two, um, I'm gonna give this a plus two and note that this means you get plus two for each direction of the line of two. So in this one we'd have a left a right, 
and then a diagonal direction, as you can see, for a total of six points on that drop. Next, we have the lines of three. Um, this is definitely should be weighted more than center column and line of two, so we'll give this a plus five. And again, both directions, left and right. And finally, a the winning, that's the best thing that can happen in the game, so we're gonna give this a very big score, as you can see, I'm writing on the screen. I don't even know what this number is anymore. Um, and I mean, basically you just need this to always select it. So it should be high enough score that it will always be picked if it is an option. Um, then we have on the opponent side, if we're leaving the opponent with two in a row lines, we'll do a minus two. And if we're leaving the opponent with a three in a row that they can win on the next turn, we'll do minus a hundred so that we always block when we can, unless we can win ourselves. Let's simulate what an AI using this scoring mechanism would look like. So to begin, at the start of the game, the only column that gives you points is a center column, which is a plus four, and all these other columns would be a value of zero. So our AI would see that this is the greatest value and decide to drop its first piece right there in the center. So once the opponent drops their piece, now we have to reevaluate the board. So once again, well, let's start with the center. So the center, if we dropped it right here, that would give us a line of two upwards, as well as the bonus for dropping it in the center. So that would be a total of plus six. If we dropped it over here, then we have one uh, diagonal direction. So that's gonna be a plus two. Right here is also that same diagonal, or same uh, horizontal direction, and this as well. They all make one horizontal line of two. This right here makes one diagonal line of two, so that's also going to be plus two. And then these columns over here, they don't add anything to us via the uh, scoring mechanism, so these are both zeros. So once again, we'd see that this is the greatest value and decide to drop our second piece right there. Okay, and this process just continues. So now we reevaluate the board. So they already have, the, this line of two is already blocked, so we don't have to worry about subtracting points from this. Uh, the center column is the kind of initial one we'll look at. So that will be, if we put it right here, that'd be a plus four for the center column bonus and then a line of three. So that's a plus nine. This will stay, this position right here will stay the same as before, but you have to add this diagonal now. So that's gonna be a plus four. This is a plus two because it only has the horizontal direction and this is a plus two. Right here makes a diagonal. Uh, line of two and there's two horizontal lines of two both the left side and the right side so that is a total of plus six right here doesn't give us anything so that's zero and right here would be one horizontal so that's plus two we see that this is the greatest value and as for a third straight time we drop it in the center column I'm going to speed this up and quickly go through the rest of them. There might be some mistakes in the numbers I'm showing on the screen, but the kind of the key takeaway is not the exact numbers, but the way that we're using a scoring mechanism to programmatically make decisions. So with that last move, the opponent made a mistake and our AI will capitalize on that and drop it to complete the four in a row with the plus 1000 score. And we win. Woo. Well, we did end up winning this game. Our AI didn't think about the future and as a result made many moves that were easily countered by the opponent. We were only really won because the opponent ended up making a mistake. And this is why we're going to build off of this scoring mechanism te technique and introduce what is called the mini max algorithm. This is a simple but super powerful algorithm used in all sorts of board games. So initially we took a board that looked like this and with our scoring mechanism, we expanded that board and looked at all seven possibilities and gave a, assigned a score to each and you know picked one from that. But why stop there? We could keep expanding so for each one of these moves that we can make, the seven moves, we expand the opponent's seven moves. And then let's just keep going. So for each of the opponent's seven moves, we expand seven more moves that we can make. 
And the cool thing is, is with our computer, we can evaluate tens of thousands of moves of like final board states in seconds. So we assign a score to each one of these 10,000 board states, and then we'll use this Minimax algorithm to pick the best one. So in a simplified version, imagine that this right here is our initial board state, and each of these two lines represents the different columns we could place our piece in from that initial board state. So there's only two lines in this diagram, but in the full like Minimax algorithm, we'd have seven lines. I just omitted them just to keep this diagram pretty simple. So these lines represent the, move, the moves we can make. And then down here you get the potential board states the opponent sees after your first move. These lines again are then the opponent's potential moves from those board states. And this just process just keeps continuing until we get all the way to the bottom where we stop looking into the future and use our scoring mechanism to evaluate the board states at that depth, which gives us these values. In this algorithm, we're trying to pick the move that guarantees us the highest score from the nodes down at the bottom given that the opponent is not going to make this easy for us and is going to try to minimize our score value every chance it gets. So we start at the top node and traverse to the left. So we get all the way down to these five and six down here. And this is our turn to make a move. So we can either make a move that gives us five points or we can make a move that gives us six points. So we first look at the left move. We see that that gives us five points. And so that's our temporary max. But then with the next option we have, we see that six is greater than five, and so we replace that with six. Then because this is a depth first search process, the minimizer then sees that, oh, there's one option here. We'll pick that as the min. So it temporarily sets six as the min, and then it traverses down the right path. So once we get to this right path, we are the maximizer player again, and we see I have the options of four and negative 100. So we first set the max to 4 and then we see that negative 100 is not greater than 4 so we keep our move at 4. However now the minimizer player sees that oh before I had just only 6 as an option so now I have 4 as an option so I would always pick the path that would only, that would give me 4 as opposed to 6 because I'm trying to make your life hard. So this is now a 4. So whatever column corresponds to this line well, then we're guaranteed to get four points at least. So we will fill in for our max at the top, four. So if we go to the left, we'll get four. Whatever column corresponds to the left, we'll get four points, which is pretty good. It's not terrible. So then we go down to the right side, see if we can do anything better. So the right side, we start, we go down here to the red and then we go to the left and then go to the left again and see that we have the option of selecting negative 100. So we temporarily fill that in, that's negative 100, and then we check the other node. The other node is also negative 100, so this just stays at negative 100. The minimizer player sees it has a negative 100 to choose from and temporarily sets it to negative 100, and then it looks to the right. See you have a nine here, so it picks that, and then it sees that the four is not greater than nine, so this stays nine, However, the minimizer player realizes, oh, I would never pick the right path when I could guarantee a negative 100. So negative 100 stays up here. So now we have the option, if we choose the left side, we get four, or if we choose the right side, we get negative 100. And as a maximizer player, we would never wanna get negative 100 guaranteed. So we will go ahead and say that, okay, the left side produces the best score, so when we drop our piece, we will drop it on whatever column corresponds to this line right here. And with that, you have the basics of an expert level AI. So combining a good scoring mechanism with this Minimax algorithm is what produces that very hard AI that beat me in the beginning. Note that the greater depth you look at in the Minimax algorithm, probably the better your AI is going to be. And also, if you want to make your AI a little bit more realistic and not as hard, uh, you can also throw in the possibility of not always choosing the best branch, so choosing like a lower scoring possibility too. 
Finally, before we end, one thing that's super cool is that this same algorithm can be super easily applied to other games. So all you really have to do is change up your scoring mechanism for other games. So for Othello, your intuition might be to just try to write an AI that takes as many pieces as possible, but you'd soon find out that that didn't work that well. You get into an unfavorable position quick, the opponent would take a corner, and then you'd ultimately end up like this. So we don't want to do that. Don't take as many pieces as possible. So instead, what you want to do is maybe write an AI that factors into account the difference between frontier disks and interior disks. A frontier disk is any tile that is touching an open square. So all of these tiles that are on the outside of the current board. Black's frontier disks are here in yellow, and then white's frontier disks are in red. And an interior disk is any disk that is not touching an open square, so these ones right here in the center. We're trying to maximize the number of interior disks we have while minimizing the number of frontier disks. We also want to factor in the different types of positions on the board. So you have corners, you have buffers, and you have edges. So corners and edges are pretty good. Corners being the best, that's weighted highest. We want to try to get that. We usually don't want to be putting our pieces in the buffers until we have a corner. Here's a nice little diagram I got from a Stanford paper that I'll link to in the description, assigning values to the tiles around a specific corner. The final thing I want to add is you want to try to get your AI to get stable disks, which are disks that no matter what happens the rest of the game can't be flipped back over. Next for chess, the basics is that all pieces are worth points. You get points for taking the opponent's pieces and you lose points for the opponent taking your pieces. And also the weighting of each piece is dependent on the piece strength. So a pawn would be worth 10 points if you take, while the king would be worth 900 points if you take, and vice versa for the opponent taking your pieces. Also, you want to factor into account the position of each piece on the board. For example, a knight is most effective when it's in the center of the board and can make a lot of moves, versus in the corner when it can't make many moves. A pawn is most effective when it can get to the very end of the board and get you your one of your pieces back, so that's why those are all five. And then finally, a king is best... Um, positioned when it's nicely protected so that's when it is castled in the corner of your uh, starting row. Worth mentioning I took these diagrams from a Medium article on how to program a chess AI so make sure to check out that link in my description. Finally we'll quickly go over checkers. Checkers is pretty similar to chess in regards to getting points for taking and losing pieces as well as piece positioning is important. And then finally, I want to explicitly mention that you want to try to get kings with a programmed AI and checkers. All right, that's all I got, I think. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you haven't done so already, it would mean a lot to me if you throw it a big thumbs up. And also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my future videos. A couple quick notes. There are some advanced topics there with a Minimax algorithm I didn't cover in this video, such as alpha beta pruning and Monte Carlo tree search. I might make a follow-up video on those. Not sure yet, but I'll put some links into the description if you're interested in reading further about those things. Also, the reason I call this the traditional algorithm near the start of the video is because in kind of recent history, uh, game AIs that use deep learning have kind of been in the press. So if you remember the AlphaGo AI that beat the world best, some of the world best Go players, that used a system of deep learning and didn't use this Minimax algorithm. That might be a topic for another video I might make in the future. And one last note, now that I've made this video that kind of overviewed the Minimax algorithm, it'll be a lot easier for me to make a video on actually programming this um, in Python. So make sure to subscribe to not miss a video on how to implement this AI in Python. Thank you guys again for watching. Until next time, peace out.